Population Control Bill. Much has been talked about it, enough politics done around it as well. But today on FII, we keep aside the politics and deep dive into the bill itself. Can India manage to control its population with this bill? Well, that's the question we're asking. And without any further ado, let's get started with our explainer. Now, the Population Control Bill, the draft version of it, once uh, it is passed by the UP Assembly, will bar people from availing the government subsidies and other government benefits if they have more than two children. Now, the two-child policy is a way of penalizing those who have more than two kids. But did you know that it also offers incentives if you have just one child? At the moment, India does not have a national child policy, but two BJP states, Uttar Pradesh and Assam, have moved towards that direction. In fact, there are some other states who have their own version of this policy. We'll talk about that as well. So, where did, where did the entire need first come in from? Let's talk about that first. India is projected to overtake China as the most populous country by 2025. And India's most populous state is recorded as Uttar Pradesh with a population of around 220 million. The BJP government has proposed this will, it says, to give incentives to those who will help in the population control. But what exactly is the target that the UP government is looking at? They want to bring the birth rate to 2.1 per thousand population by 2026 and to 1.9 by 2030. This, they say, will stabilize the population in the state in order to promote sustainable development and also equitable distribution of resources. So like we said, under the bill, those who have more than two will stand to lose and those who don't will get incentives. So let's look at first the penalties here. Penalties for those who have more than two children. They will be debarred from government welfare schemes. It will, there will be a limit on the number of ration cards that the family can get, only four. They cannot apply for government jobs and there will be a ban on contesting local body elections as well. But if you have only two children, there are incentives like government employees will get two additional increments than their peers who have more than two kids. Subsidy for purchasing of plots, houses, rebates on utility charges like water and electricity as well and maternity and paternity leave for 12 months. There will also be a 3% increase in the employer contribution under the National Pension Scheme and free health care and insurance for spouses. But to avail any of these incentives, what do the parents have to do? They have to undergo a voluntary sterilization after their second child. They will have to produce that certificate and proof of that surgery and only then will they avail these benefits. And if you thought those perks were plenty, think again, because the draft bill also has maximum incentives and even cash rewards for those who decide to have only one child. If you have one child, then the perks are plenty, even if you're not a government servant. For parents who are not government employees but have one children, again, these, they will have to undergo voluntary sterilization. They will get rebates in taxes on water, housing, home loans. If a parent of a single child opts, to, opts for vasectomy, that is, then the child will be entitled to free medical facilities until the age of 20. Such children are also proposed to get free education, insurance and preference in government jobs. If a couple, which is in the BPL category, which is below poverty line, they have only one child and they undergo voluntary sterilization as well, they will receive a one-time amount, a cash reward, so to say, of 80,000 rupees if the single child is a boy and 1 lakh if the child is a girl. The act shall also apply to married couples where the boy is not less than 21, of course, and the girl not less than 18. So that's about UP. But what about Assam? Well, in 2017, Assam brought in a population and women empowerment policy in which government employees were asked to strictly follow the two-child norm and the policy also included panchayat and other local body elections under which anyone with more than two children can be elected or nominated. Also, no government jobs would be given to persons having more than two children. This was after January 1st, 2021. But 
a lot of people think it's just UP and Assam, which has been often discussed. But the two-child policy in its different avatar, different forms, is already in place in seven other states. Let's take Rajasthan first. The two-child policy for government employees was actually relaxed in 2018, which meant that the compulsory retirement on the birth of a third child was removed. This happened ironically under the BJP government, but even now those with more than two children cannot contest local body polls. In Madhya Pradesh, the two-child norm for government services came into being in 2001, which meant that those with more than two children were ineligible for government service. However, after again their relaxation in 2005, they could contest local body elections. In Gujarat, those with more than two children cannot contest any local body polls. This has been in place since 2005. And in Maharashtra, those with more than two kids, again, cannot contest any local body polls. Women with more than two children cannot benefit from public distribution system. Ironically, the burden of responsibility here is on the woman. In Urissa, the Zilla Panchayat Act bars those with over two kids from contesting elections. So the two-child policy, as you can see, has been around for a while in various forms in different states. The thing to note here is that the other state apart from UP and Maharashtra, which have the highest population, is Bihar, where no such provision is in place. But these population control measures first began in China, remember. China was the first to lean on these coercive instructions and instruments to, that penalize parents to curb population growth. But let's see what happened there, because China is a fascinating story. In 1980, China implemented the one-child policy for population control. But in 2016, they replaced the one-child policy with two-child limit. And experts said that the policy failed to result in a sustained surge in births as a high cost of raising children in Chinese cities deterred couples from starting families altogether. And now, as a result of that in 2021, China has announced that it would allow married couples to have three children because of the alarming decline in their working age population and a significant increase of the elderly population. So what exactly are the hits and misses there and what can India do? Are there any learnings from this? Is this telling us a story? Well, we've got experts for you. We have with us uh, Poonam uh, Mutreja. She is the Executive Director of Population Foundation of India. We've got Gyuzvanis. He's the Assistant Professor for Political Science at Ashoka University. Uh, we'll be joined shortly by Dev Jani. And we also have Mr. Nambiar with us, who we frankly were trying to get a policy expert who will have uh, to say something on this policy. But we were struggling to get somebody who actually felt that there would be some good that will come out of this policy. So right at the onset, before we discuss, uh, get into the discussion altogether, I just want to say that this is not a political debate. We're just trying to look at some facts and figures and try and understand which way are we going with this one. Let me give the first word to Poonam there. Poonam, uh, you and your organization has been working at length on trying to understand the population. Many have called it explosion. We'll talk about whether or not that's the case at all on how the population growth in the country has been. And you believe that this bill will not solve the problem at all. Why is that? So any form of coercion which is, which is a result of a one-child or a two-child policy will lead to distortions which China has already experienced. And as fertility declines in India, you see adverse sex ratios, which is what I call distortion. China stopped the one-child policy and came to two-child policy and very quickly three children because one, the sex ratios declined very rapidly. And the sex ratios in China are as a result of sun preference, while India, we have not only sun preference, but we also have daughter aversion whether it's to do with dowry and social norms and patriarchy and a whole 
range of reasons is not our uh, subject today, so I won't go into that. Mm. Second, in a democracy, this will not work. There was so much anger in a country like China. Another reason which they don't admit publicly, the Chinese, but I've looked at the research, the, uh, so, anthropological research. I've spoken to a lot of mm. academics and traveled across China six times, understanding the impact of the one child norm. And I found that there is an anger which they are well recognized, though in a democracy it doesn't matter so much, as, uh, sorry, in, in China it doesn't matter so much as democracy. Let's not forget the forced sterilization of thousands of Indian men led to a political party losing elections. Mm. And it, in India in nine, uh, uh, after the emergency, and let's also remember that for 30, almost 30 years, our family planning program, which was the first program in the world to start a family planning policy, hmm. um, we, it was a wasted decade, three decades okay. of wasted. Hmm. Finally, it will not work because people in any case want fewer children. The wanted fertility rate in India right. is 1.8%. When And there is a huge unmet need for family planning. So we have 18, 13% more uh, children than families or women want. Right. Why don't we look at that? Why don't we provide family planning services? In any case, even going back to China, unless you have literacy, literacy rates mm -hmm. increasing, you have better health facilities, so you will access not... to contraception, female literacy, contraception and financial independence for women, all of that has contributed in many ways in what your studies are also saying to actually solving the population China. problem and what happened in China which seems to be the cue for what we're doing here and what the draft will seem to be suggesting is not working. Let me get in uh, Gills on this one. What are your thoughts? Well, my thought is quite frankly, I don't know what else is there to say other than this proposed bill is a bad solution to a non-existent problem. Uh, India does not have a problem of uncontrolled demography. Uh, the, totally, the total fertility rate, the TFR, has been con declining consist consistently over mm. the years, mm. including in UP, where it should be uh, around, around three. This is based on data uh, released by the government's Ministry of Health and, and, and Family Welfare. Mm. And as uh, Dr. Mutreja says, we know what are the factors that reduce natality, access to healthcare, care, education, mm. economic uh, security, effective social mm. uh, service delivery, and so forth. Why do people uh, produce a large number of children? It's to achieve the kind of economic security that social systems do not or have failed to provide uh, over the years. Right. And these require right. yes, long-term... I just want to interrupt for a minute because while you talk about the fertility rate, I just want to tell our viewers as well, the total fertility rate, just to get a UP context on this, all right? From 1996 to 2016, in UP alone, it dropped from 4.06 to 2.7. Right? right? When the India average in the same time period fell by only 0.7%. <coughs> so this is telling you that the numbers are already on the decline. In fact, interestingly, in a Lancet report that came out, they made some predictions on where the population, not just in India, but across the globe will be going. Their prediction is actually very fascinating. They say that in 2017, India population is going to be about, uh, they said 138 crore. 2048, 160 crore, it goes up. And then in the 2100, their prediction is that it will actually come down. It will come down by at least 32% and will be at 109 crore. And they've used several socioeconomic indicators to make this analysis. Just can you just sort of lay down for our viewers simply on how is it that this analysis has been arrived at? Yeah, and therefore the question is, what is the problem that this bill seeks to, uh, to, to, to solve? There is a passage in the bill that's very telling, which is attempts would be made to ensure there is a population balance among various communities in the state. That alone tells you that this is not about tackling a general population problem, but to avoid uh, what is perceived to be a fear of dilution of you know, the majority community. Uh, the slogan "Humdo Humari Pachis" is still, you know, spread around, uh, despite the fact that all those myths regarding, you know, uh, minority groups, their demographies in India have been completely punctured. One can read Dr. Qureshi's recent book on the population mm. myth, 
where he uses publicly available government data to uh, burst completely those uh, right. myths about Let me take that to Mr. Nambia. Let me take that to Mr. Nambia. Mr. Nambia, the Lancet report also says that there is currently, their words, fear mongering around what is said to be population explosion. They say nothing like this actually exists. So what problem is this bill actually solving? Sonal, well, in the 1990s, when I was in the school, I believe that fourth standard onwards till maybe to the 12th class, I, we were always studying in the history or in the social studies that the population control and the importance of population control. Today, when I'm listening to both the other panelists whomsoever spoke before me, today I feel that all those which I was, I was taught in the school was all completely wrong. We need to understand the economic reasons why it is required to be done then there is a social re re reasoning why it is to be done. Uh, in fact, I was actually very curious uh, when I was invited for this show, I was keen to join on this because this is something which I was also very quite studied well from the last uh, close to a but decade. But the numbers, and these are numbers I'll, from I'll, the I'll, National I'll, Family I'll, Health Survey. No, no, this, is the government, the this is the government data. No, so, so you no, can't I'll refute these numbers. numbers. Let's go with the Lancet numbers because in NDTV has got a special liking generally for the the numbers which come from the American uh, American numbers. The Lancet number. By okay, let's not go there. Okay, this is no, what no, I didn't want. So no, let no, me sorry, go to the I'll other panelists now. I'm sorry, I'll have to interrupt you there. No, no, uh, Dejani, your, uh, your, your thoughts very quickly on this, please. Devjani, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, please go ahead with your thoughts on this. Yeah, actually, like, I would say that population control at this moment is required for India. Because uh, this is the most populous part of the globe because of the climatic conditions. This is the most, I think this is the most comfortable part of the whole globe. Hmm. So the population outburst of this part of the globe is actually affecting the whole globe. Because we are not con remaining confined only within the subcontinent, but we are also migrating elsewhere. So it is actually a global requirement right now, population control. Now that how we would have it in, in a more human fashion. In my opinion, yeah, in my opinion, you know, childbirth is not a matter of liberty. It is a matter of responsibility more than of right. So now, and in my personal opinion, this like flattening, like two children for all, this is also not correct. It is oversimplification. Hmm. You know, uh, we should have like now, how many children a couple can actually give birth to okay. should depend on, it should vary from couple to couple. And it should depend mainly on three parameters. One, the earning of the particular couple, hmm. the how right. much house space he or she can provide to hmm. the child, hmm. and the health parameters of the couple concerned. These are the three most important parameters. So, there are innumerable couples in India who are not really eligible to bear even a single child. This is precisely the they should not have even a, they should not give birth to even a single child because they okay. don't have enough space to stay at because for proper you know child birth is more about responsibility it is okay how we groom our future i generation. have to interrupt for a minute over here and slip into a break but uh, i think we've heard from both sides on this one and we also give you a good explainer let's quickly dip into a break and when we come back we'll talk more on this time to bring us our special broadcast on Vaccinate India. This is in partnership with Google, where a lot of queries that come around vaccination around COVID, we try to solve that for you with some experts. Joining us today on the broadcast is Dr. Avi Kumar. He's the HOD, Pulmonology, Chest and Sleep Medicine, Fortis Scott's Heart Institute in Oakland. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Kumar. My first question is, often Googled as well, is about can a vaccinated person 
give COVID to a non-vaccinated person? Uh, what we have seen is that the vaccinated person can get infected with COVID and uh, they generally have very mild infection. Whenever the patient gets a COVID, he is an infectious. But the mild infectious infections generally they transmit very less and they, they do recover very early. So vaccinated patients generally they have mild infection and they recover early. So the infectiousness also decreases far. All right. So good to have that clarity. Let's get the next question. And this is often regarding vaccination, right? So people often Google, should they avoid alcohol after vaccination? We understand the importance of keeping yourself hydrated, not just before, uh, not just after, but before vaccination as well. Could you tell us why that happens? Generally, uh, what we have seen is that uh, alcohol generally reduces the efficacy of vaccines. So it should be avoided for at least four weeks after vaccination to get a good response, immunogenicity, good immune response, for, so that your antibiotics, uh, antibodies are uh, made in good quantities and you are immune next COVID infection. But talking about immunity, let me bring the third question for you, which is how long does it actually take to develop immunity after COVID vaccine? First, after the first dose and then the second dose as well. Generally, what happens is that uh, what we recommend is to our all patients that two doses of vaccine should be taken for all the patients to protect themselves against the COVID. And after COVID, generally it takes about two weeks, more than two weeks to get their, themselves immune. So we have seen patients in the second wave that they get uh, vaccinated and they get uh, the infection. So it is not due to the infection, might be they catch caught infection during the process of vaccination. So uh, vaccine does not cause any infection. The immunity develops after two weeks. Right. So you're saying between two to three weeks is when you achieve the maximum potential and the immunity and antibodies develop from the vaccine. Thank you so much, Dr. Kumar, for taking all those questions. Thank you.